there's four friends today. Let us take a look at this absolute monster of the sword, a fantasy falchion named Revenge of the King, designed by Brother Nesenio and realized by Pernod and Al. Wow! The design combines several historical falchions of this kind. Now we have several surviving examples of the cleaver type falchion from the 13th century. And they're in pretty good condition. This one combines one particular specimen called the Kangye falchion, which is famed to be used by one Sir Kangye in his quest to slay a dragon. And you can see that's Pretty much a medieval fantasy sword already. Here you can view the Kanye Falchion in its full glory at Durham Cathedral. It is quite unusual because of this uh, swell in the profile. At the broadest section, it is almost three times as wide as the base. So you can probably see how this gives the idea of that's somewhere between a conventional arming sword and an axe. I've talked about this misconception in the past that falchions are actually very thin, delicate slicers to cut up soft targets on the battlefield instead of being just brutish, clubbish weapons that hacks down into armor. And if you look at this falchion, it's a pretty good representation of a falchion of the similar proportion as the Kanye falchion which is, uh, in itself, is quite atypical comparing to some of the other clear functions such as the Hamburg function and the Clooney function. This one here is not a one-to-one -one replica as the Kanye function has a pretty straight spine and because of the increased rate of broadening in the blade, there's almost a forward curve in the edge but the spine remains straight. This one, as you can see, is not like that. Rather, having a center line of the blade aligned with the direction of the tan and the grip. So, if you look at the spine, it seems to have a slight curve backward. This is similar to the function house at Hamburg Museum of History, even though that one is much shorter, like most of the surviving cleaver functions. And obviously, if you have this broadening profile, the longer it gets, the broader it will get as it just continuously broadens uh, as it goes above the blade. So this one is close to 28 in the blade length, and at the broadest section is 10.7 centimeters in width. And that is incredibly wide as far as uh, medieval swords are concerned, or even just as any sword at all. Overall, it weighs 1302 grams. That's almost identical to the Kanye function. And if you look at the width of the base and the broadest part, it's almost, almost identical to Kanye function and the blade lens, of course. However, here's a Part. That's different from the Kanye function. It's a sickness. Often people ignore the sickness and the tapering of it, but it's an incredibly important aspect of the weight distribution, which dictates how the sword would move. And this weighs 2 pounds and 14 ounces, which is not really heavy for a sword of this size. You would think that it would weigh a ton, 4 pounds or something, which is not the case. It, Itself, it feels not lightweight, but it's just pretty average. But as soon as you drill hit it, and soon it, you, you find out that it's just pretty clumsy. And it's not because of the sword's overall weight, it's this weight distribution. You see, because it brought it so much, it really needs to have a very dramatic distal tapering in this dimension. So over here, it doesn't carry too much weight uh, comparing to the base. And this one does feature a pretty pronounced diesel taper. 
at base is close to 7 millimeters in thickness. Up here, at the point of percussion, at the broadest part of the blade, it's 3 millimeters. That's really quite an alright distal tapering, as it lost almost 60% of the thickness on the upper portion compared to the base for an army sword or such. But for this profile, it simply isn't enough. And I have to stress here, the design by Brother Nasenio specified this broader section should be two millimeters thick, but the maker didn't manage that, only had it around three millimeters. So potentially, this could increase its mass near its broadest section by 50%. If you look at Kanye function, it's said that at the broadest portion of the blade, it's 1.2 millimeters in thickness. And that's quite extraordinary. I can't even fathom how you can execute such a thin blade that wide. It feels just like a sheet of metal. But somehow, it maintains its strength, and it often astonish people who have the chance to handle the sword. Thickness as it go near the base, at base is 6.4 millimeters in thickness. So that's more than five times the thickness. You can see that even though it broadens to this degree, almost three times as wide, up here, the Kanye function is only less than one-fifth of the thickness. So overall, the weight at this top portion is about 60% of the base, or probably even less. So that sword is still pretty hefty. You know, it carries that amount of mass, that amount of steel up here. But compared to the base, it's just still wieldable. This one it is wieldable as well. If you consider the mass distribution, you will see the chart first, the mass, overall mass, as it goes along the blade, it comes down a little bit because the base has a short recousal, which not only makes the blade extra durable in parrying, as you're not supposed to cut with this portion, but you should mostly parry with the base or the straw of the blade. It also adds some mass, some more steel to the base, so that's great for weight distribution. But as it travel along the blade, there's a pretty evident concave point or hollow ground geometry on the blade. I don't think that's really needed for the lower portion of the blade. On the upper portion, that's sort of needed, especially if you don't have the spine that thin. Now, I understand that smiths usually are nervous creating a blade that broad yet thin. It will make the blade rather flexible. And if you look at one sword made by Pernanel for Sword Trend Jesse, as his master sword, it got too thin to the point that it's just too flexible, like an aluminum foil. It's still very springy. It springs back to true, but it flexes too much uh, because of the thickness. It cuts pretty well still, but in fighting, as you commonly change direction, it will just flex on its own and it will destabilize the blade. It wouldn't cut as well as you typically would in test cutting, where you just swing the sword in one direction, no need to do those fainting or uh, redirecting of the blade. So I understand the smith's desire to keep the spine a little sick, even on the upper portion, but you really need a deep hollow ground to make the majority of the blade thin. That's not just related to the cutting performance, it's reducing a ton of weight Let's just say if you can hollow grind the blade on this portion to something less than 1.5 millimeters, you reduce 40 to 50% of the weight up here. And that would just make the sword much nimbler because it's so far away from the hand. That's 26, 27 inches away from the hand. The further away that this lump of mass is from your hand, the clumsier, I guess. Just think of the, an axe or a club, right? There's more mass on the upper portion. And you can see the mass distribution comparison between these two functions, uh, whereas the less mass the tip carries in comparison to the base, the nimbler it gets. You can see the Revenge of the King 
represented by the orange graph here, has a sudden drop in the mass, but as it travels along the blade towards the tip, it has a slight upward tick. So it feels kind of clubbish. Whereas uh, the blue line representing the Kang Ye Falchion has a steady decline because of the distal taper. Although you can see, comparing to a contemporary arming sword, it's nowhere as nimble because the arming sword has lost so much more mass near the tip comparing to its base. Uh, but the Kang Ye Falchion still has some decline in the mass distribution, making it more wieldable. Uh, maybe you would say that, okay, that will introduce more mass and make the cut more authoritative, uh, generate more impact. That, that's true, but if you look at battle axes, they're typically short, because you don't want a solid lump mass too far away from your hand. It will just make the swing too slow. If you look at the point of balance on this one, it's quite extreme, really far from the hilt, almost nine inches. So one third of the blade's length, that means that the action point, the pivot point, is just too far from your hand. Yeah, a stronger individual will be able to use this sword, uh, especially if you apply a lot of the shoulder rotation. But first of all, rotating around the shoulder, which is Make, make the swing slower, you have to chamber the swords backward, it'll make the swing pretty obvious. Obviously, you will use a shield to pair with the sword, ideally. That will address some of the defense uh, issue. You really defend with your shield, deflect, parry, instead of using the sword. But still, having a long wind up, it just make all the attack overly obvious and easy to dodge, easy to defend. It also decelerates the speed when you eventually swing forward because a sword rotating around the wrist will generate a lot more tip speed. Now eventually it got translated into kinetic energy and momentum, which is basically what damage is. But if it rotates around the wrist too slowly because the pivot point is so far out, it wouldn't do much damage, even though there's a lot of max in here. Also, it is strictly to be used in one hand. Look at the grip lens. Right? It barely fit my one hand. So, there's only one anchor point on the sword right, from you. Not like a two-handed sword. If a hefty and coxy two-handed sword, you can imagine that you still have two anchor points on the sword to increase the stability control the sword by a great deal. Not to mention that you can apply the strength of two hands, right? the leverage as well. So you will have much better control over the sword and you cause more damage. It's also more stabilized, which is good for sword play because it tends to roll less as you cut into the target, especially a sword this flat. I use the sword as a single-handed sword in test cutting, it did cut, but not too well, just a mediocre cutter. See, the problem is the blade is too broad. So this is the initial cut. Once it enters there, this line is pretty straight. And this is scooping, meaning that the blade is twisting, it's flexing. So it's losing power, it's absorbing the shock by 
over flexing. So by the end, it pretty much lost all its uh, cutting potential. It just ripped the whole thing out. Pretty oblique angle. Let's see how it travels all the way down to the bottom. Sick and fluted. So this edge is plenty durable. Another issue is the width of the blade. As it's so much wider than regular swords, it takes much longer for the entirety of the blade to pass through. If the trajectory of the cut isn't 100% flat, when the blade passes through, the cut doesn't appear as clean. Most descending cuts seem cleaner and smoother than ascending and horizontal cuts. That's quite surprising. If you look at the blade profile, that's strictly a cutting-oriented sword. That came from the time 13th century, when there were an increased number of combatants on the battlefield. When you are a knight, well protected by mail armor and sometimes coat of plates, just uh, steel plates reinforced circles, you really want to chop down less protected combatants in great number, right? Those peasant levies dressed in nothing but gambeson or sometimes just plain clothing. A cutting oriented sword will work very well on them. On the other hand, when you face more armored opponents, you use the arming sword, which has become increasingly tapered at this time. And you can see that, yeah, the base is pretty broad, broader than this falchion, but the profile taper dictates that on the upper portion, there's a lot less width. And combined with the distal tapering, it also sends out dramatically. It has this profile not only more proficient at thrusting, into the gap of the armor or into the mail, but also very proficient in cutting because it moves fast. Look at how, just how fast it rotates around the wrist, whereas this one is just so slow. That is all right because they are for different purposes, cut and thrust, and pure cutting power. However, you still have to maintain the correct amount of weight distribution for the sword falchion to function well. My test cutting shows that because it's a slow moving sword, it doesn't cut smaller targets that well. Sometimes it, after it cuts successfully, it will just change direction slightly. A narrower sword wouldn't matter that much, you just pass through the target already. Whereas the blade this broad, you just scoop around. Even though the change of angle might not be very obvious. And it's also less precise, much harder to control. When you add two hands on the grip, right, even though there's no space for your hand, you can still grab onto the pommel. It's actually quite comfortable because of the geometry of this pommel. And you add a lot of stability, even though there's not much leverage because there's no more lever. So you can't space out your hands, but it just makes the cut much stabler. It tends to not grow and rotate the blade, so it cuts more cleanly. When I do the test cutting on pork shoulder under eight layers of linen and tons of tape, it didn't cut too well when I use one hand. It's still, the edge geometry is good enough and there's enough mass to lacerate it through eight layers of linen as a tape, but it merely nicked the flesh underneath. So by no way is a debilitating blow. Okay, so 
this is how it does. As you can see, it did under broke all four layers. And can't exactly. Yeah, I cut about yeah some superficial cut. I think the problem is the meat is moving inside this pocket. So every time there's an impact, it just moves downward. But it did provide enough uh, backup for the textile to be cut. Obviously, there's an impact factor. If you chop onto the bony part, it's like a chopping board. It will receive more damage. The flesh will be cut more. The bone can be broken, obviously. But still, it's just slow and just doesn't cut too well. When you have two hands, I was able to cut the pork cleanly in half and consistently so. Wow! So, this shows the full benefit of having this uh, broadened areas. Uh, almost forming a spike over here. So the point made the first entry and brought this very hefty portion of the blade into the meat. Just look at how deep. <laughs> yeah, totally through. It cut the meat completely in half. I'm just looking at the bottom tray. If you can see here, yeah, it cut to the tray. After taking out all the meat, we discovered this. So one cut actually bypass all the flesh and tray and tape linen and went deep into the tree what the hell? yeah I think suffice to say it did its job yeah this eight layers of linen didn't really do much to stop it Linen plus all these um, tapes. These tapes are somewhat cut resistant as well. So you can see, Jesus, yeah. I think that that's completely through. Yeah, it's severed in two, yeah, all the way through. And this time it broke the tray. Yeah, yeah. all the way. It just is completely in half now. So actually in three pieces, so one, two, and there's another chunk, three, yeah. Let's do a step. Wow, it's a lot of, okay. That's the advantage of having this tip geometry. It was a step, it missed but it cut, it's a push cut into the meat. Pretty handy, let's do it again. Oh. But look at this, the depth of the stab. Yeah, by stabbing in, it also cut the meat. It was just very broad. It's now let's look at the wound and this is a one cut from the falchion. You can see the depths. I would say three to four inches. Very, very smooth. As from the two-handed cut, where the offhand supports the pommel. There is enough stability and leverage to move this almost three pound of steel. And this is the other cut. It's just narrower, smaller mass, but still very, very smooth. So this is way smoother than the cut from the butcher. So this is the edge of the pork shoulder. Look at this. Just like a mirror. All right, and this is the other chunk where we cleaned the wound. And this is a shallower cut. As you can see, it stopped here because it didn't break all eight layers of linen. So as you can see, some probably nerve structure been broken here because they are stretchy, but this is cut underneath the fabric, right? So it pushed the fabric into the meat, but still look at the 
Look at the surface, it's very smooth. Very smooth cut. About two inches deep. And this is from another cut. Made some bacon, very smooth. The other side, also very smooth. Uh, this is the stab and miss and turn into a push cut. Uh, I cut open the fat and the flesh underneath. And this is the biggest chunk that survived. And you can look at the, yeah, this is a side from the butcher, cut by the butcher, and this is by the falchion, right? Huge slab of meat, cut in yeah, half. Surface is very clean. And here you see there's a hole in here, and that's from the stab. So that's the exit wound, whereas this is the entry wound. Look at this. Because of the broad tip, it cut all this flesh and it enters in there and stab into the tree. Overall, it's quite a striking sword with not only an imposing and unique blade, but also hilt furniture of interesting details. The brass wheel pommel has hand-carved lion's head on both sides, and the lateral surface of the wheel has decorative firework that reminds me of the longsword house at Cluny Museum in Paris. The tan is hot pinned to the pommel. The blue leather wrapping on the grip has a strong contrast with the gold color of the pommel. The grip has a swell in the center in both dimensions. A central spacer and cord wrapping are there to ensure enough traction for the hand, so you have good purchase on the grip. The cross guard has a swelled center to be flush in thickness with the grip. The crillons are of octagonal cross section, and the edges are rounded off to avoid any hot spot. There are decorative grooves filed onto the guard, and the extremities have cross decals carved on. A cross is also carved onto each side of the center of the cross guard. The hilt is solidly constructed. I chopped some green wood, and there's no rattling or movement afterwards, nor was there any dulling of the edge on the blade. About, say, one and a half inches. Lower than the last time, but basically cut it halfway through. Blade is straight. Edge definition. Seems to be some minor bowing. No deformation really. Yeah. So some quick polish will address that. Yeah. Quite like solid. No rattling. No movement. Very solid blade. It's a very well-made hand-forged, handcrafted sword. I just wish the maker could stick to the design of Brother Nathaniel and taper the blade further down to the 2 millimeters specified. And with the existing color round geometry, significant amount of mass can be reduced from the foible of the blade and then added to the base by having a gradual transition from the rectangular cross section to a convex geometry and then eventually transitioning into the hollow ground cross section on the upper portion of the blade. So. The sword overall will be better balanced and rotate better. It is still a fascinating fantasy sword, and I'm very grateful of the opportunity to handle the sword and assess it before even the designer and owner. An update, this sword was eventually gifted to another sword friend by the name the Blue Chevalier, who has some experience in the past dealing with project swords, doing additional grinding and such. I hope this sword has found a good new home as a nice project and I'm eager to see what comes out of it after the Blue Chevalier's additional modification on the blade.